regardless of whether you're going to do <clears throat> rapid toilet training or long way toilet training, there's a whole bunch of things you need to think about to get ready for it. So let's start talking about urination training first, right? Urination training. I'm not going to use that word a lot. Uh, I'm going to use the word pee because that's my word for this process. It's important that you understand what's involved here. <clears throat> so here's what's involved. Urine is made in the kidneys. You can see them yellow on your screen there. Flows down these little tubes called the ureters and ends up into the bladder. And uh, then exits eventually through another little tube to the outside called the urethra. And in people with both male and female anatomy, there are tiny, tiny mus muscles called sphincters. Here there's, here's where they're located <clears throat> in the female anatomy and the male anatomy. And those sphincters are constantly contracted to keep urine in the bladder. They're contracted to keep urine in the bladder. So in order to urinate, those muscles have to relax to let the urine out. So toilet training really involves teaching an individual to relax these teeny tiny muscles that you can't even see, and there's two pairs of them, at just the right time and in just the right place, and that's not easy. That's not easy. Right? You can't touch the muscles. You can't show people the muscles. They don't even know the muscles are there. And yet, in just the right place, at just the right time, they're supposed to relax and let the pee flow out. So we need to really think about how hard this is, and we need to make sure that we're in the position to be able to do toilet training. The first thing <clears throat> that you want to check, if there are any kinds of concerns at all about medical issues that might affect pee training or urination training, check with a physician before beginning. So if this is an individual with spina bifida, for example, he or she may have what's called a neurogenic bladder, which is going to make it difficult to toilet train because of the physiology of the person. Or if the person has frequent bladder infections, there may be some issues you want to know about. Or if there are urinary tract disorders. Any concern that you think might affect toilet training that has to do with the parts of the body that I just showed you on the previous slide, um, you want to get a medical check off before you start, because that's just important, right? That's just important. Um, you also need to prepare yourself. So here are the kinds of things I hear people who want to train say. I've tried everything, and nothing has worked. This will probably be a waste of my time. This workshop will probably be a waste of my time, but I'll go to it anyway. It's only two days. What the heck? I might learn something. I already know that so-and-so can't be trained, but maybe I'll learn something that will help someone else out. And toilet training for everyone? Ha! You've got to be kidding. Right? These are the kinds of voices in our heads sometimes about toilet training because we have tried to do it in the past and it hasn't worked very well, and we've kind of thrown up our hands and gotten really discouraged or given up. Katie and I feel your pain. We know what it's like to try this over and over again and fail. And after a while, you just think, it, this is a hill that's too high to climb. It's not going to happen. It can happen, even if you failed in the past, and part of what needs to happen in order for toilet training to happen is you need to prepare yourself to be the trainer. It's very important to see this as an instructional challenge, not a behavior challenge. You're not, this is not someone who's deliberately peeing in the wrong place because he or she is out to get you, right? What you're really doing when you're tra toilet training is you're unteaching old habits at the same time as you're teaching new ones. It's not a power struggle. You know, especially those of you working with older individuals, this person's been wetting him or herself for 19 years. That's what he or she thinks is supposed to happen. You pee in the diaper, right? And now you're trying to teach them, well, actually, after 19 years, there's a better way to do this, right? That's not going to happen without a lot of work on your part. And some of it 
is sort of getting yourself ready emotionally for this and framing it as an instructional challenge, not a power struggle. So you need to be planful. You need to have a way to breathe and stay calm. You need to have a reward at the end of the day for your progress as a trainer and for your perseverance as a trainer. Whatever that is, you know, ice cream, wine, I don't know, cheese and crackers, whatever it is at the end of the day that you reinforce yourself for, for getting through another day as a trainer. And you also have to remember that when people pee in a diaper, it's called an accident for a good reason. It's an accident. They didn't do it deliberately to make your life miserable or to make you crazy. Right, so that, that's really important. We see a lot of people who think this is a big power struggle. He knows what he's supposed to do. He just won't do, you know, it's deliberate. No, 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 no. It's an instructional challenge. It's not a behavior challenge. So you need to really prepare yourself emotionally and mentally to be able to do this in a calm, even-handed, objective kind of way. So that's another thing. Another part of getting ready is thinking about when and who is gonna be the trainer. When will someone be able to really focus on this? And by when, I mean during what stretch of time? You know, sometimes I see families trying to tr toilet train over the Christmas break. Really? Do you really wanna do that over the Christmas break when there's all this other stuff going on, a lot of which should be celebratory and different and you know, really, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not, right? What's, where, where is there gonna be a period of time where someone can really focus on this? Who has the commitment and motivation to be the trainer? Who has the energy and time? Who? will be able to follow through, right? Ideally, more than one who, right? The more who's, the better, as long as everybody's doing it the same way. But if there's only one who, that's fine. But there has to be a who. There has to be a who, and there has to be the right when. So really think about this, right? Really think about this. Sometimes the best time to do it is over the summer, for example, right? There's no school, kids can stay home, the schedule's more relaxed, you know, right? Sometimes, I, I don't know, it, it will depend upon your situation. The bottom line, though, is if the timing isn't right, if there's not a good who and a good when, don't, tr don't start. Don't start. Because, because it will make you crazy, <laughs> and it probably won't work. And we want you to be successful. So... Think if you're part of a team, an early intervention team or a school team or an adult support team, think about when and who will be able to devote the time and energy that's necessary for this. So that's the second piece. Oh, and so if the timing isn't right, stop. If a committed and motivated person isn't available, stop. You need both of those. You need both of those. Okay, next part of getting ready, clothing. You cannot train someone who's wearing diapers, period. The diapers have to come off. The pull-ups have to come off. The whole point of, the whole point of pull ups is to wick the pee away from the person's body to make the person more comfortable. You actually don't want that. You want you want the feeling of wetness to be there. And you can't tell if the person is wet or dry if he or she is wearing pull-ups. If you can't tell if he or she is wet or dry, they can't tell if they're wet or dry, right? So you have to get rid of the diapers and the pull-ups. Now, some of you are groaning now, thinking, oh, I can't do that because this person's in school, and if I get rid, he's going to be walking around. No, no, no. I didn't say you can't have anything to protect the person. You just can't have diapers or pull-ups, right? The person needs to wear regular underwear in the training setting. So 
You might be training at school, but not at home. You could do that, by the way. You could train at school, but not at home. You could train at home, but not at school. Mind you, what you're going to end up with is someone who's trained at school, but not at home, or trained at home, but not at school. I mean, you don't have to do it at the same time in both places, but the likelihood of it generalizing is not terribly high. But wherever you're training, the person has to wear regular underwear with some kind of waterproof pants over them to protect clothes and for hygienic reasons. So you want the underwear on the person so you can tell if they're wet or dry and so they can tell if they're wet or dry. But, you know, you have to protect their outer clothes, especially if they're in school, so they're not walking around with wet pants all the time. It's fine to wear diapers or pull-ups during non-training times and at night. So put the diaper on, put the pull-up on at night because you're not doing night training for now. Right? And if you're only training during a certain chunk of the day, you can put the diapers or pull-ups on for the rest of the day. Right? But during training time in the training setting, regular underwear. Now, I don't work for this company, but there is a company that sells really nice waterproof pants. They're soft, they're breathable, they don't crinkle. You know how the old plastic pants, when you walked, went crink, 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 crink. You knew somebody had plastic pants on? These don't do that. They come in infant, youth, and adult sizes. They're a bit pricey, but you know, you can wash them. And they also, by the way, have swim diapers in all of the sizes. And the site is mylilmiracle.com. Now, I know you can buy them in North America, and I know that they'll ship to many countries, I'm not sure about the country that you live in, um, but this is a good source of waterproof pants to wear over the underwear, over the underwear, to keep the outer clothes dry. Seating, really, really important, seating. You need to think about seating. For boys, or for people with male anatomy, um, you need to decide whether to train in a standard or a seated position, at least initially. And you need to think about the age of the person and the person's physical abilities and individual preferences, of course. My preference is to train seated initially, and then you can always, because that way you can, you have the potential of both pee and poop training at the same time, okay? Which often happens, but you have to be seated for it to happen. But for older individuals or be, depending upon personal preferences, you know, you may make a different decision. You may decide for standing initially, and that's just fine. And Katie can talk about that a bit more as well. Um, if you're seating, you have to ensure proper seating. The person has to be relaxed, and it has to be impossible for the person to fall in. So you can't have a little kid balancing precariously on a toilet seat. By the way, don't use a potty. Please don't use a potty. If you use a potty, you're then going to have to transition to the toilet, which is a whole bunch of extra steps. So why use the potty in the first place? Train on a toilet. Train on a toilet, right? Get a plastic seat insert if you have to. Use an adapted chair. If you're working with your occupational therapist or a physiotherapist, find an adapted chair if the individual has motor problems. The, you want the feet to be supported. So it's a little kid. You need some kind of raised foot block to achieve proper seating. You might even want the kind of foot block that puts the legs way up into a sort of semi-crouch position so the knees are higher. That's actually a, a good position for bowel training. Um, if it's a boy and you're training seated, you might want, you probably will want to get some kind of seat insert that has a lip so that the pee goes in the toilet and not depending upon you know, what the anatomy is all about. You want it to go in the toilet, not shoot across the room. You really need to think about seating, right? It ha the person has to be comfortable, relaxed. Remember, what he's going to try to do is relax those little teeny muscles. So he has to be relaxed to do that. Um, and he's really comfortable on the toilet. You know? And there's all kinds of, I mean, you can buy 
you know, toilet seats like this one that play music and flashlights, you know, so that you can make sitting on the toilet a whole bunch of fun as well. So seating is really, really important, and you might have to work with someone else to be able to accomplish that. This is the uh, squatty potty. Um, so you put your feet on it, and it actually raises the knees up quite nicely so that you're in a better position for pooping as well as for peeing. So think about seating and make sure the feet are positioned and the person can't possibly fall in. Um, for individuals with limited or no speech, um, you want to have some kind of communication modality that eventually the person hopefully will learn to use to indicate that he or she needs to go to the bathroom. So that could be a photograph or a manual sign for bathroom or, you know, toilet or bathroom, um, a, a picture communication symbol like this one. It, whatever it is that you're using for the person's communication symbol uh, system, you, you want to have that available. You want to work with your speech language pathologist or whoever to have some kind of symbol that indicates this, this activity of going to the bathroom.